Yeah. Hi. Um, as as you may have seen my little note, I, th I thought it'd be fun for uh, the first ten minutes pre class to uh, anybody else wanted to uh, you know show a pet or uh, something like that or something interesting. So there's a few of you on here now, and um, if anybody has, I know most of you are at school. Maybe your pets are at home, but I think it's kind of fun. So if anybody wants to uh, share their pet, just jump on here and do it. You know. I got a pet. Good. Let's have a look. <laughs> All right. I'll be right back. Hold on. Yeah. Fantastic. Those are some cool ones. I hope you all like my little dog. That basset hound is kind of cool. Little floppy ears. I guess I got to show you my other basset hound today. Oh, you got another one? <laughs> oh, yeah. I have two. <laughs> oh, I want to we look at the other one. We'll, we'll, all right. I'll be back. You, you, yeah, yeah. You can go next after this, this first one. All right, so this is my dog. Her name is Dino. Nice. <laughs> now let's see. Hold on, just a minute. Why? Why can? I, oh, I, okay. Talk again. I want. I want to see your thing. So you come up there. So my dog's name is Dino. She's a a bearded <laughs> dragon. Cool. Um, her name is Dino because I originally thought she was a boy, and I felt like. I had been calling her Dino for so long that it'd be disrespectful to change her name. So she is so, so Dino. What's her name? Dino, like Dean Martin, you know? Oh, cool. You, you yeah. like the Rat Pack stuff, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Rat Pack's the thing. Yeah, they're cool. Yeah. So so this thing's called a bearded dragon? Yeah, but she's like a, she's like a dog, you know? Yeah. The... um. Elementary school, oh, oh, I can see out the window here almost, is, is uh, the uh, Gilbert Linkus and the Linkus lizards. And they had a great big old uh, iguana or something, maybe like what you have there as their pet in their office for years and years. I don't know if they still got it. Well, in, ca in captivity, they could last 15 years. But yeah. in the wild, they only last five. So I felt like I was doing her a favor. Yeah. Cool. Put her up yeah. high so we can see her. Or, or, or show more of her. Does she know any tricks? <laughs> Absolutely not. She knows how to eat, though. That's the most important. Yeah. Do you put her like on a on a leash and take her for a walk and get looks? Yeah, <laughs> she's actually her uh, tank is at the window, so she gets to see all the cars driving by all the time, which is nice because she likes the outdoors and she can't go out there all the time. Yeah. Wow. That's fantastic. I it looks like she likes you guys. <laughs> yeah. Hi there, Dino. Call her Dino or Frank or uh, or um, um, uh, Sammy or or the yeah, other. Yeah, yeah. You call her any of them, honestly. She yeah. she uh, embodies the whole Rat Pack. <laughs> yeah. The old old time Vegas. Yeah. Cool. I got him uh, here. If you want to see him. <laughs> okay. Next. Oh, we got a basset hound. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hold on. Let me. Okay. What was your other one you showed last time? What was it? Uh, that was Josie. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what was that like Michael Jackson there or something? Show? <laughs> Thriller or something. Yes. <laughs> Okay, we got we got Basset Hound coming up here. By the way, if we don't get okay. to everybody, well, we got lots of classes. We'll log on ten minutes every day. It's Carl. Carl. <laughs> <Come on. Right. laughs> Vegan, come on. Carl. This is Carl. <laughs> hey, bud. He's a big one. <laughs> He's huge. Yeah. Now, do you, is this like an apartment, a tech that they, they let you, let you, or in Blacksburg, they let you have dogs? No, I'm staying home this semester. Oh, this is your house at the home, yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> cool. He's a ginger basset, though, so. <laughs> yeah, a lot of you guys, like I said in my note, a lot of you guys are, you know, you got your dogs at home and, and just got pictures, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, pictures work, too, but. But you guys are home. Where, where, where do you live, Zach? Uh, I live in Pound. A place called Pound? Yeah. 
<laughs> most people dog. most people never hear it. It's in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> you're in the you're at the pound with the dogs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, I live at the zoo or something, you know. Okay, right. Cool. Um, very nice. Okay, well, um, anybody else got a, a beast of some sort they'd like to show? Show a picture of my dog. Sure, let's take a look. This isn't one of the best pictures. I've got a better one, but this is when we were outside. His name is Nero, and he's the, uh, he's a German Remember. Shepherd Husky. Uh, Great Pyrenees mix. Cool. And he's a huge dog. I love him. So, so we just had Rat Pack dog. Now we got a Roman Emperor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice. So, so I, I guess obviously it's at your parents' house or something somewhere. Yeah. I mean, all my classes are online, so I could go home, but I'm already paying for an apartment that I signed a lease to, so I can't really just leave. Yeah, yeah, on the, yeah, it's weird. A lot of people could stay home, really. If, but if you're paid for any way, then you, yippee, you get a chance to get away from your parents. But then you can go home when you want, you know. How far, where, where are you from? Uh, you've probably never heard of it. It's called Fuvana. It's uh, up by Charlottesville. It's south mm -hmm. of Charlottesville. Yeah. I've been to Savannah. Yeah. So, so it's far enough away that if you don't want to go home, you say it's far away, but if you want to go home, it's, you know, two hours or something, you can be there, you know? Yeah. And Fuvana sports are trash. I can get behind that. What's that now? It is a fluco. That's a good question. Our mascot was called a fluco and nobody knows what it is. And it's supposed to be for like Fluvanna County. It was like the first three letters of Fluvanna and then like CO of County, but it's just so stupid. And it's, I don't know, it kind of annoyed me like going there, but so I'm a tech, what, kind of a mascot, what kind of a mascot did they dress up like? Like a lion or, or a bear then or something? We had Fluco Man and he would be wearing tights and then this really tight shirt and then have a cape and they'd have his mask on. And it was so weird. Well, I mean, what really is a hokey? Yeah, that's a good question too. You're supposed to say, I'm Yeah. yeah. You're supposed to say, there's no hokey just one school that doesn't have a defined mascot to another school that doesn't have one. I thought our mascot was named after the hokey stone. <laughs> I think the hokey stone is named after the mascot, but uh, the chicken or the egg, who knows? It might be. And now we ended up with some kind of a, a turkey, I don't know. Maybe they just like Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yeah, Thanksgiving's kind of a fun time. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, this is fun before class, you, you know, the, the, you know, life can be so impersonal sometimes and, and with 400 students, even if we're there, it's just don't get a chance. So anybody that wants to participate in these things, um, um, 10 minutes before class, I'll log on and some days I might play music for you. If you want, I'll, I'll answer. You don't have to, of course, but if you got anything you want to share, I got, uh, I got some pictures I don't have anymore. I had a pet deer. I should bring in, I should get pictures on my computer of, of the pet deer when we had her. Um, I just, I didn't, you know, you can't go buy a deer, but the, you know, she, she was, she was a uh, collapse there in the road and I picked her up and her mother had run away. So I, I started feeding her and, you know, she uh, grew into a perfectly well adapted deer and, you know, was with us for about two years. She ran off during, uh, we didn't see her anymore. It was one year it was hunting and mating season. So, um, we went with the theory that she met a handsome buck and ran off, but in reality, she probably got shot, you know, a tame deer. So not the best pet, but, uh, you know, I, I didn't choose her. I found her and it was kind of a great experience to have a pet deer. She really was the most affectionate animal. I mean, would come in the house and just sit by my, sit by my feet for whatever time, you know, of course I fed her four bottles and I fed her all the time when she was young. So she, I guess. She thought I was her mother or something. I don't know what, what she thought, but she was a really cool animal. <laughs> My dog killed a raccoon once. Our dogs, our dogs the other day, 
my wife is taking, we have three of them. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring another dog or two in here to show you guys too. But uh, they saw them. They all got yanked off the leash and got loose and they pounced on this possum. And we go, no, no way. We tried to save the possum. And he, he was laying there like he was dead. And we pulled the dogs away and, and the dang thing just rolled over and ran off. It was playing possum. I understand what that, that is. Was. That is the worst thing ever. Like I said, my dog killed a raccoon once. But when she, was, when she was younger, she'd kill possums in the middle of the night. So my job was always taking the possum and throwing it on the compost pile out in the field. Yeah. So one night, it's like probably, you know, two or three in the morning, the dogs killed a, a possum, I presume. So I get a shovel and I pick up the possum and I'm taking it out to the pile, right? And then I'm not like halfway there. And then the possum comes back to life, scares the crap out of me. Yeah. It's just darts back into the into the darkness but yeah, yeah possums are just the worst yeah play possum i mean you see where the, you, you you know just like you know that dang possum look he was all on his back looked like the dogs had jumped the dogs had jumped on him and as soon as we pulled the dogs away pulled them off he just rolled over risk scurried off it's funny as oh yeah yeah they are some durable animals i don't know how yeah. they do it they can take at least you, at least your dog can kill the possum my dog just rolls on him there you go. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, anyway, thank you. Um, so if others, um, if if other folks have things, just you know, pictures of your pets or interesting things, I'll do this. I'll be logging on ten minutes early. I mean, sometimes we might want to early start on uh, technical questions, but I think this is kind of fun. Okay. Let's get going with the class. Today's class. What I want to do is I'm not going to pour over every every page, every symbol in my chapters two and three, but I want to make some, some, uh, some more comments about those chapters um, for a few minutes, you know, and then we'll get to, to more details about programming MATLAB. So here we go, share screen, <clears throat> chapter two, physical processes. As I said, this, this course is a course in numerical computing and programming. However, we're not just going to solve equations just for the fun of it, although there's nothing wrong with that. Our equations generally we come from, from physical problems in engineering. And I'm sorry, I mean, certainly here, especially early, we're going to do a few problems that are just, you know, just, just calisthenic like MATLAB things. But generally, the motivation in the, in the course of events is you, the engineer, have a physical problem that you want to solve or you want to study or you want to design something. So you use the laws of nature or physics the best of your ability. You formulate a mathematical model. Then you need to solve that model. Um, generally numerically in, in industry, almost all the time, kind of what we're doing here. And then you'll use that analysis to, to examine the results. Um, perhaps make design decisions, perhaps try to understand how the thing moves, how hot it gets, the pressure, temperature, voltage, whatever. Um, so, um, when I say the word is applied mathematics, what I mean by applied is applied to physical processes. So the physical processes are, and I won't pour over them all right now, I'll refer back to them as needed, but um, this is interesting, the conservation laws, the, the rate equations, and the property equations. One of the more important conservation laws, especially to us, the mechanical engineer, is the conservation of momentum attributed to the great Isaac Newton. Please see the Principia, published in 1687. Um, you know, I, I awe at the, at the thought of Isaac Newton. Um, but anyway, he observed that a object moving, it is momentum will stay the same. It's mass times its velocity will the same, will stay the same unless there's a net force acting, unless net unbalanced force. So he proposed that. For an open system, for a closed system, the mass is constant, so you can bring mass outside. That gives us the, the famous special case of it, mass times acceleration is some of the forces. If it's an open system, often used in fluids and thermal problems, um, then momentum can flow in and then you have this more detailed version where they have contributions to inlets and exits. So that's an example of that. When we need one of these conservation laws, like we'll certainly use F equals MA, 
we will certainly use conservation of energy. So I'm gonna refer back to these pages as we have examples and as we need them. Now, the rate equations. The conservation equations like conservation of energy are great except that you'll end up say with one equation or three equations and way too many unknowns. For instance, in a thermal problem, you'll end up with temperatures, heat flows, and a variety of, of parameters. And so say you write a single energy equation as you might do in ME3304 heat transfer or in all your thermal, in thermodynamic studies, you might have one equation and you might have several variables like temperature and heat flux. And as you know, mathematically, if you have one equation and two or more variables, it's an, it's an, you know, it's, um, it's an underdetermined system. You don't have enough information. So Joseph Fourier came along <clears throat> in the early 1800s and proposed that if you have an object like this, let's say you have a solid wall, he observed that if one wall was hot, if this is a solid piece of material, if one wall is hot like over here and then the other wall is cold, that heat will flow from the hot to the cold. And this Q double prime is the heat flux. It's in watts per meter squared. He made the observation that not only does heat flow, the, heat, the law of heat conduction, it's not only the difference between the hot temperature and the cold temperature, which makes sense, but it has to do with the, the distance between them. That is, you divide by L, the length of the object. So if T hot is 100 degrees and T cold is 10, you have a 90 degree temperature difference. But if it's a thin slab, they're closer together, you get more heat flow. If it's wide open, if it's a big, a thick slab, you'll get less. In other words, the thickness is downstairs. The heat flux is proportional, not just temperature difference, but temperature gradient over L. Further, he noticed that different materials under the same conditions, let's say the same hot coal, let's say exactly the same geometric piece, the geometry in the same hot and cold, that different materials will act differently, different amounts. He characterized that as a property called thermal conductivity to make finally his law of heat conduction, one of the most famous rate equations and useful um, in certainly applied physics. Um, here's the temperature gradient. Here's the property that defines the material, and here's the negative sign. The negative sign is, there in, is in there mathematically because heat flows from hot to cold. It's like you need to make sure that the natural flow of things is from the high points to the low points. A ball will naturally roll downhill. And if you think about calculus, that's the way it goes. Now, thermal conductivity characterizes the material. For instance, metals will have a a fairly high conductivity, 200, 400 you know, watts per meter squared K, um, for meter actually. Um, something like a plastic or a ceramic will have quite a bit lower around one. And one of the lower Ks that does us some good is air. Still air has actually a very low thermal conductivity. Now when air moves, that's a different matter, but still air has a very low conductivity, which means that given a certain temperature gradient, if you can capture still air, that's a pretty good insulator. And that's the basis of most common insulations, household insulations, fiberglass insulation. It's not the, the, ins the fiberglass or anything like that. It's this, this system captures still air and air has a very low conductivity. Double pane windows work on that same principle. It, the double pane windows gives you a, a big advantage um, insulating wise, not because there's more glass because of the double panes, but because the two, the two pieces of glass capture still air in between them. So anyway, Fourier made this tremendous observation. I, I guess it wasn't that people didn't feel this before, you know, physically from walking around the world, but he was the first to put it in mathematical form, the great Joseph Fourier. He, uh, along the way, came up with a notion of a thing called a Fourier series. Most of y'all at least heard of it and probably don't know quite what it is um, given time. And here we might cover that, but um, he came up with this idea of a Fourier series. As the history says he went to some meeting and first presented it and they told him he's, you know, hey Joseph, you've had too much wine, buddy. This doesn't make a bit of sense. He was ridiculed. And 
you know, 40 or 50 years later was the first, the next paper that came out in the literature. Now, now, anyway, he kept with it and now it's a, one of our most famous and useful mathematical techniques. So he stuck with his guns there. Um, so anyway, we got the rate laws. We'll refer back to these when we need them. Okay. So these are, these are what I call the laws. of. And, and notice if there's an energy equation, for instance, and you have both temperature and heat flux and, and Q from conduction and T in the same equation, you don't have enough material. But this rate equation gives you an, another equation to work with, a second equation. And now temperature and heat flux in the same equation. Now you can usually replace heat flux with the temperature rate. Now you have a single equation only in the unknown temperature. You at least have a chance to solve. That doesn't mean it's easy to solve or whatever, but at least it's well posed mathematically. It might be one very difficult equation for temperature, but at least you have a chance. Okay. I will refer back to this at appropriate times because I want to get on with this. Um, what's nice about having this book, we'll continue to refer back. Now, um, share screen. I want to go to chapter three here. Now, this chapter three is really what we need, is modeling of physical processes. And that's really what we need to do as engineers. So we need to say, here is the mathematical model that we think describes this mechanical, thermal, electrical, chemical, biological problem. And what we do is we take the laws of physics as we, as we know them, conservation of, of energy, conservation of momentum, Fourier's law, Ohm's laws, and various things, and put them together to hopefully form a mathematical model that, if solved, will replicate the actions, the dynamic behavior of the system. So when I, I used, I've taught system dynamics, which has gone out of phase, but no, and um, mechanical vibration. Actually, any, every course I teach in mechanical engineering, heat transfer, me mechanical vibrations, all of them, really the modeling is huge. So what we do is we, we're looking for a cause and effect relationship. Actually, this little picture shows it. And this is really what you're, you're given mainly as a, in your engineering. You walk into a, a, a class, electrical, electrical theory, thermal things, mechanical things, chemical things. The professor tells you what you're doing. The professor basically tells you what the system is. Here, it's a, it's a piece of metal. It's this much thick, and it's got these conditions. Okay, good. This is what we're doing to it. This is how hard, if it's a mechanical system, this is how hard we're pushing on it. If it's electrical system, this is applied voltage, etc. So the professor tells you about these two boxes, and then you, the student, your, your assignment, your homework, your task is to find the response. And that's pretty much what we do. And you walk around, I mean, maybe not in your English class or something, but I mean, basically, as, as mechanical engineers, you walk around all day or I guess sit in Zoom lessons all day doing this. The professor tells you the system. And so that's what we're looking for, cause and effect. Here is a system defined by its materials, metal, how thick its dimensions and things. Here are the forcing functions. How much, you know, while you're putting a heat source, or you're putting a heater on it, or you're pushing it, and you're supposed to find the response. And so to develop a model to do this is important. Um, I got a lot of interesting things here. The dependent variables, that is, say, the temperature response is a function of the independent variables. Um, that's like space and time, perhaps. System parameters, like the material it's made of, the geometry and such, and the forcing functions, what you're doing to it. And then, and so that's generally what we're looking for. That can be very difficult and it's generally done numerically. And this course is about numerical and programming. Anyway, um, let me show you one here that's of importance. There's a couple of ones here. I will refer back to the section, but we, we need also is a complete mathematical model. So section 3.3. A complete model covers not only the governing equations like F equals MA, conservation of energy, but it also includes boundary conditions if you have spatially distributed problems, which we won't do much, if any, here, and initial conditions for transient problems to get a complete formulation. For instance, here is an all-time classic in mechanical engineering. I have 400 students. Some of you have seen it 500. You've seen it like three or four times in your studies. Some of you have never seen it. 
but you can't see this this age old classic enough. It's just a you know landmark of mechanical engineering. So here's a here is a mass, and there's a some kind of an elastic element, a spring like a coiled piece of metal or another elastic element. There is some frictional um, hook up here, and there's an applied force. Say this, that you apply this force. So what you do, this is a mechanical problem. The objective of this analysis is to find the resulting motion X. Knowing this mass here, knowing the spring constant K, the damping coefficient C and the applied force, your objective is to find X. So the system is defined by how big the mass is and how big the spring and the damper is. The forcing functions on the system are what you physically did. This is you grabbing it and actually pulling at something. Also, the initial conditions are actually forcing functions, and you're supposed to find the response, x versus time. A good old classic. I, I, you will, if you haven't seen this before, you will many times in mechanical engineering. I suspect everybody's seen it at least once. So, you have to select the correct law to apply. So, I, you know, since you're looking for the motion of a mechanical system, I suppose you could apply Ohm's law and all the electrical stuff, but probably that won't answer the question of how, how it's moving. Not that the electrical part's wrong. Obviously, I think to select F equals MA would be the, be the choice here and whatever. And there's a tool that we use. Now, this is the physical system. This thing is called a free body diagram I have here, which you cut away the things, you cut away the uh, uh, applied forces and you replace them by equivalent little uh, mathematical vectors here. It's called a free body diagram. It's a technique used in statics and dynamics and all mechanical uh, ways of doing things. So you cut this mass away and you're gonna do apply F equals MA. If you know the forces, you can simply add them up just like balancing a checkbook. So there's the applied force you're pulling and we're calling X down is positive. So you're pulling down. When you pull it down, the spring stretches. So the, K, the KX is the spring constant. If it's moving down, where's the, the damping? Always works against motion. So you have CX. And so here's two, two important things. The elastic spring works in proportion to stretch. The damper works in proportion to speed. That is, the faster you go, the more damping you have. If you stick your hand out the window, you're not supposed to stick your head out there, put your head back in. If you stick your arm out the car and you're going down the road at 30 miles an hour, you have a certain amount of force you need. But at 60 miles an hour, it takes you a little more strength in your arm to hold your arm, you know, at the same position out the window. It's probably not a good thing to do that. So this is a damping kind of a term, proportional to velocity, and there's an applied force. At this point, applying F equals MA, the mass times the acceleration is just the sum of the forces that you see in this little diagram right here. And you can form here, you can apply Newton's law. The mass times the acceleration, which is acceleration is two derivatives x. You see a, a negative damping force, it's, it's in the negative direction. You see a negative kx, and you see an applied force. Now, of course, depending on x, the, the motion and the velocity of x, these two forces could come out to be either positive or negative. But this gives you then this famous equation of motion for a spring mass system. There's the mass times acceleration, there's damping, and there's kx, and it's applied force. Now, there it is. So, if I was to ask you, or someone was to ask you, formulate a complete model of this math of the system mathematically and let's say you handed in in your paper what's outlined in gray right there you would get at least in my class a significant point deduction because although this thing in gray is a huge piece of the modeling and extremely important you haven't completed the model this thing in gray is not enough because it's a difference a second order differential equation so this information, you need more information to solve this problem. Explicitly, you need to know, since it's, second or, since it's a second order, you need to know x when you started the position, and you need to know the first derivative, the velocity. Without the initial conditions, you don't have enough information. That is, you cannot explicitly solve for the motion. You can solve with the symbols x not being up, but if you actually want to put numbers in this thing, and actually solve the motion, you must specify the initial conditions. 
Um, sometimes there's one if it's a first derivative, two, et cetera, like that. So this little table here would be the complete mathematical model of the system. And, and the laws of physics plus the auxiliary conditions you need, like a particular initial conditions, are all important. So we might get the heat conduction later, but this is important. Well, for, for, we will absolutely. This, um, I do different examples on different semesters, depending on my mood. Um, but the one I always do is the spring mass. It leads into your system, um, your mechanical vibrations, courses of controls, and one of the most useful things students have said, uh, written back to me, God, that was useful. And, you know, uh, hey, gosh, you know, uh, could you have more codes like that one that we did? Uh, thing like this. It's an all-time classic and we'll absolutely cover it. I, I can't guarantee what other co problems we'll cover this semester. Maybe the virus one since it's relevant. Um, thing. So there you go. That's what we call a mathematical model. And you'll hear math, the word mathematical model several times. So if I ask you on a little in-class quiz, and we don't have time for a quiz today, but I'll give you one maybe Wednesday, um, about a mathematical model, what else do you need? What else do you need in addition to the equation of motion? What else do you need? You would answer that you need initial conditions. How many? Two, because it's a second order, being the initial position and velocity. And only then, this, now this doesn't mean this, might, this is an easy system to solve. Who, who knows what the solution is? But at least it's called well-posed. That is, you have a mathematical chance to solve the thing. And on, you'll find that maybe with Laplace transforms and all those kinds of math things, we would kind of get complicated. What we'll find here in MATLAB with ODE45, it's like, oh my, oh, wow, this is easy. You know? No problem, as soon as you learn ODE45. So you will be able to solve equations like this plus much, much more uh, complicated ones. It's amazing what you can learn to solve in this class. Okay, one more thing before we go on, and I will come back to these um, yes. Uh, there's a question in the chat. It says, in our own study time, should we only be focusing on the things that are gone over in class, or should we be teaching ourselves the entire chapters? Um, well, I, I will, as I said, I'll, I'll go back, like, let's say we're doing an example in, of conservation of energy, and I didn't go over it in detail, but um, I'll go back to that chapter. You, you will go back to, ch particularly, chapter three and MA chapter two, the laws of physics, as needed as the problems arise, you know, as, as the special cases. So just know that chapter two is a summary of the laws of physics has been laid down in chapter three, which is really the most important for you guys as to modeling. So um, please look them over and, and, um, and read them all. And throughout the semester, I will be clicking back on chapter three and I remember in there kind of thing. So, yeah. Anyway. So they're mostly like a reference for us to go back to as we like encounter these problems throughout the semester. Yeah, and mathematical, I mean, um, you, you know, math about, especially about mathematical model, what it is. And students get, you all have a lot on your plate, you know, and, and you've got all this Zoom and all this links and all this stuff. And I don't know, I, I mean, I don't feel sorry for you, but I know there's a lot to do. And I, get, I think students sometimes lose the forest for the trees, you know, like, you know, I'll, I'll even ask the students something in, in mechanical vibrations about mathematical model and they start doing Laplace transform. Is, is the Laplace transform a, a mathematical model? No, it's, it's a mathematical method proposed by some, I don't know, French dude, Laplace or whatever, you know. And it's just important to know what is what and where you're at with these things. You know, what is a mathematical model? What is a mathematical method? What is a numerical solver and all these things? So we'll continue to refer back to those. You know, if there's something important that's confusing, I will not say it once. As a matter of fact, I say it so many times sometimes. Some students say, you know, God, you've been over that 20 times and others go, you never even talked about it. Right? Same thing. But anyway, um, let me just start talking about this, this chart here. It's kind of interesting. I have uh, the, the number of variables in a system, like one, two, three, you know, continuous things. And I have linear versus nonlinear models here. And up in this corner, is the, it's the easiest from the left. The easier problems that are up in the upper left, the more difficult are here in the gray. But we will certainly go over problems of exponential growth, that is, things like the electrical RC circuit, lump thermal things, these kinds of things. We will go over nonlinear things, stuff that get really weird and go through character changes and, and really interesting things. 
When we get to two equations, we get to our linear oscillators, really important. The spring mass thing, and then we can get the more complicated circuits. And all sorts of, um, I think we're talking about um, astronomy, you know, like the two-body astronomy problem. Nonlinear, we get to the one of my all-time favorites, the pendulum. It's actually a nonlinear two-order system. All sorts of things, you know, predator-prey models, nonlinear electronics. But anything, things get more complex when you can get three equations, when you get as up to three equations and nonlinear, actually, if this, this is the box where all hell can break loose. Systems can go chaotic, depending how far we get, we may or may not go into there, but I'd like to delve at least into the little world of chaos, mathematical chaos. It's a fascinating and important topic including, you know, the weather problems and the fractals and the all sorts of things. Anyway, we get into then collective things like wave mechanics and heat conduction and stuff like that. And then eventually you get into a set of, and these, these problems up here in, in the, with the white background are fairly well known and documented. This layer area in gray is still a lot to be determined. You know, a lot of how coupled nonlinear oscillators work, a lot of biological systems like heart cell synchronization, neural networks, ecosystems, complicated econ uh, economics, continuous systems like, um, you know, nonlinear waves. That's a fascinating area. General relativity, which is a fascinating area. Reaction diffusion systems, which would be really relevant to today's thing. I don't know if we'll get to that, unfortunately. Things like you know, epilepsy, heart fibrillations, you know, pathology things, turbulent fluids, and maybe the most complex of all life itself, you know, the, to understand, you know, why we're here, how this all works. I mean, I think life itself is perhaps the ultimate problem mathematically. And um, when we're done with this course, you will be able to solve this group of problems um, I'm, I'm, please don't be disappointed if at the end, oh, you said you were going to tell us what the meaning of life is and stuff. No, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry about that. Can't quite get to there. Okay. All right. That's an overview. And we will refer back to here. And, and that's the nice thing about the book. I mean, when we cover something, if we, when we get use it again, you remember in chapter five, we did this and refer to it. All right. Now let's get to, to some MATLAB. I, on the, on the what you call it site or this that's the share screen mm. where the heck is zoom oh, oh. Mm. Sure. Mm. okay i want to get to the to the, the caesar dashboard thing all right there's nothing okay Let's get to our class. I, there's a lot of information on this site, but at least it's a common repository, and at least it's all there working the same thing. And let me let me go to the student view just to make sure that what I'm looking at is what you're looking at. I, I like that student view character. So we got some hidden things that you can't see. What I've put in, I guess, was last night sometime. Um, some Fonder files, MATLAB. Okay, under MATLAB, first of all, there's these there's these commands and introduction things, which will be worth going over. Um, and then I put in some little exercises. So here's the introduction. And I organized it by sort of topic. I didn't just, you know, these are basic operations, matrices and, and all this stuff right here. And basic operations include, and we did this somewhat in workshop one, how do you, add numbers in MATLAB and how do you do various things? How do you clear the workspace and things like that? Now, let's start with matrices, okay? And let us, now I have that thing there, so you have that thing in front of us, but, um, I mean, this is just something I came up with when I was doing. There's nothing magic about this, except that these are all really fundamental things here. 
So let us go to MATLAB, launch MATLAB, and, and do some of these things. Where the heck is MATLAB? There it is. I'll have to, I'll have to go back to stop share and share MATLAB, I guess. All right. Okay, MATLAB takes a little bit sometimes to crank up. Dr. Vick, why is this loading up? Yes. Um, I was wondering for the in-class quiz Wednesday, is that going to be based on completion or accuracy? It's going to be like kind of oh, on what's that completion or accuracy? What uh, screen sharing is tough. Ooh, uh, I'm not quite sure what your question means. It's the, the class quizzes are not going to be that involved. And um, they won't be a whole lot more than were you in class with some brain function going on? Sometimes I like to ask like the first question I, because they're kind of limited to true, false, and ABC. You can't really get involved. Like for instance, I think last time I won the, my first quiz question was your education is important, true or false? Of course, that's an opinion but I have a strong opinion on one of those, so I'm not, I don't want to do that again. Anyway. Share screen. Share screen. Share screen. Share screen. Share screen. Oh, I shared that lab. Share. Oh, I can look up there. Okay. All right, here's MATLAB's environment. What comes up, the, uh, uh, the script window didn't come up because I don't have one in there right now. But what you see is this is the command window where you can type in commands. Here's your current folder showing some things there and here's your workspace. And so like the little matrix thing I have in my, my, my thing, um, you can form a matrix like a equals and the details i mean the details can absolutely brutalize people if they don't know them one say matrix one two three four and, and the, the kind of parentheses and all the parentheses and the comma and the semicolon and all the details uh and we can say them, but and I've got my little summaries of them, but I think to experiment is the thing. For instance, A, comma, 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 like this. Now, generally, if a matrix has some structure to it, some mathematical structure, you don't need to type in all the numbers. For instance, if I, if I wanted you to type in the matrix one through a thousand, you go, I just, uh, really, just the way you did, just keep typing. But... Um, so here, and, and when it comes to creating matrix, I mean, Mat MATLAB is matrix laboratory. So anything about a matrix, including utility tools to create them and manipulate them and do this and that with them in addition to multiplying them and solving them, MATLAB has a pretty complete set of matrix operations known to man, plus some little tools to use. For instance, the, the colon means um, one through four, you know, like this. And you can continue to experiment. I like to put a, a space in there. Uh, I like to ex continue to experiment. For instance, you can do one through four, but you can do, if you, if you want, um, increments of a half I think you put that in the middle I think that's the way you do we'll experiment here so here's the little details if you say one through four it defaults the, um, the step size as a one if you want something other than one you have to type it in the middle here and so now you get one one half etc like that okay we we've got these things we can tell you but I find that these I learn these things and they stick with me when I do what I'm doing right here I type them in for myself 
we all have different learning styles, but I'm a very visual learner. I'm a very do it by myself learner. So I tend to learn better by experimenting myself um, rather than have a teacher bark at me about something. I do like to have a good teacher to get me on going on the right track. But after that, you know, uh, let me figure it out for myself because it's just better for me to do it that way. So there's all sorts of commands here. Um, uh, there's a Lin space command, like what the heck is Lin space, you know? And of course you can always do help. How to get help is always a great thing to know. I like the doc version rather than the help version. It just looks nicer and more complete. Okay, let's see this one. Hmm, wonder why. That doesn't come up, huh? Oh, it's a different screen. Okay, well, I won't, I won't bother them. I'll get rid of the help thing. I hope I don't kill all of that lab by doing this. Okay, but anyway, it didn't show up in your screen, but that gets you the information. Now, what I find, and the limb space isn't all that complicated, but nevertheless, when, when, if it's a brand new command for me, and I kind of have an idea what it does, but I don't know the syntax, and I read this thing, it says all this junk, I, oh, I think I know what that's saying, but I always experiment with it. You know, don't ever be, don't ever be so pretentious you think you can just go roar ahead and get it all right the first time. None of us can do that. I've made, my personally, so many mistakes on a computer. I, when I first learned something, I don't think, oh, I got this right. I think, no, now what did I do wrong this time, you know, kind of thing. But uh, I eventually persist and get it. So you can read the documentation, but then you can experiment in space you know i mean i've used lens space so much i probably don't need to experiment anymore but the first time i this was one of the first time i used it so if you want to do what well, space one through ten see what it does okay and as you can read in the instructions what it did was made a linear a linear sequence of numbers between one and 10, and it defaulted, its default is 100, 100 numbers. This is very useful for plotting because when you want to say make the X axis on a plot, it's very nice that you want to plot something between zero and 10, or one and 10, um, to be able to automatically create a vector of 100 points. And, and often a plot with 100 points generally give you good accuracy. Sometimes the plot wiggles so much you need more, Often that's an overkill, but that's your standard, I think, plotting uh, uh, default in most computers. They, they go with 100 points there. Um, let's see, get this thing out of here. So if you press the up arrow, by the way, you get your uh, lab. Professor? Yes? Is the numbers that are generated between those two, are they just random points on it, or is it in a specific order? No, they're very evenly distributed. And as, as, and, and as a matter of fact, there's so and this is another thing. This test was not, that I just did was not the best test because there's so many numbers to look at, it's hard to tell, right? But let's do lin space if you put, as it says there, the, if, you put, if you don't put anything after this, it defaults to 100 numbers. But if we did, um, let's say one, two, three, and let's say we did three numbers, what would, what would you expect for the output? This is creating a linear space between one and three, making one, two, three. It was one. Let's see if it does it. No, it didn't do it. I don't know. Just one, two, three. There it is. Okay. Question then. Well, I was just saying, like the test that I did when you were going through it. I have a MATLAB open up too, where mm -hmm. you said a hundred points. I just did it from instead of one to ten, I did it one to a hundred, so it's even steps and whole numbers. So that's the way I tested it. Right. And that's, that's a better way. That's a much better way. Cause then you, these numbers, the numbers make sense. Like those, what are they? Like I, but I think even a hundred numbers is too many to look at at first, the art of testing. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put more about the art of testing or make a book on it or something. See this test, the first test was good. One through a hundred. That's a good one, one through 10 with a hundred numbers. But I'm like, where am I at here? I love this test a lot more because this showed me, this gave me more confidence. I know what I'm doing. And even one more time, let's say we did, um, oh, six numbers between there to make sure. Six numbers, now is that, is that six numbers evenly spaced between one and three? 
a little harder to see, but yes. So this is what I call the art of testing. Don't ever, don't ever, as your first test, try, you know, a hundred or a thousand numbers. Test it on two numbers, three numbers, four numbers. So you gain, gain confidence. Something like Lin Space, for instance, you know, whatever you do that way. Um, one more time, I mean, the, the testing, one through 10. Let's say we did 10 numbers. Yeah, 10 numbers. But, you know, if we did, let's say we had a graph from zero, zero to 10 with 10 numbers. Well, then it comes up, you know, every 1.1. So if you're going from zero to 10, you might want to put 11 numbers. So there's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. So we could experiment with each command, but make sure these, these elementary commands may be mysterious at first, your first time, make sure these elementary commands, you thoroughly know what they are and, and go through this testing procedure. So like right now, because, because of these kinds of tests, I can't ever imagine my life can't remembering what LinSpace is. Um, Maybe if I don't use MATLAB 20 years and get dementia, I might, but you know, I, I, the, because of this kind of ex ex testing that I do, I tend to remember things. Um, all right. So, so many things. Now, you know what we could do here? Mm, I've got these little MATLAB exercises up there on the computer and And let us look at, stop sharing, let's see, share something. Hello, how are you? Um, oh, this thing, yeah, okay, sure. Let us go to MATLAB Basics. And I, I won't pour over every one, every little exercise in all of these. We don't have time, plus to do some on yourself. I think, I think the 1.1 is somewhat like your first workshop, but let's, let's look at this one. Matrix exercises, matrix, matrices are so important and they, they are the fundamental data structure of MATLAB. Therefore, you need to know matrix. I've had several students ask me, hey, Professor Vic, I did terrible in my linear algebra course and I just, I'm intimidated by matrices and don't understand them. Can I, can I get by MATLAB without knowing matrices? Uh, no. And O. Oh, period. There's nothing I can do about that. You've got to know about matrices. So there's going to be questions like, what is the difference between multiply and dot multiply? I have that one on there because I've been asked that 500 times or more. Um, so let, let's, let's start to answer some of these questions in 1.2 1, 1. And, and make a little file to do it. So I've got a copy of that out here. Oh, let's see, where the heck is my copy? Oh, that's what I, matrix exercise is 1.2. Oh, there it is, okay. Uh, there's some way to uh, share. No. Okay, <laughs> let's open up what's called a script file, new. Up here in the corner, I don't want to go too fast, click, 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 but new script. Okay, there we go. Oh, I guess I was the second one there. This is what's called a script file. And in other words, what the stuff I just did in, in the window, the, uh, the command window, will be lost if I turn off the computer. Maybe then the history will be there. But if I want to do some things and, and hold it for posterity so I can hold it, I want to at least form a script file. We want, it looks like we won't get to today. We need to do about a function file too. So this is 1.2. I'm going over 1.2 matrix exercises. Matrix exercises. Did I spell that right? Anyway. Okay. Oh, I see I'm not thing. Okay. And I'll put this as a, as a, I love this thing where you can put the double percent and the percent to form new sections. Okay, the, the question asks, what's the difference between dot multiply and multiply? Okay, if you look up, MATLAB's help, it'll say something like multiply is, is full matrix multiplication and dot multiply is element by element, 
element by element multiplication, which at this, at my old age, I have no trouble with that because I've done it for so long um, with Mohammed and Jason, no problem. A beginning student, this, this causes, this is one of the most common questions and one of the most common mistakes I make. It's been made. So, you can, you can type those word answers in, but let's try the, 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 the exercises I get. So let's say all those words don't make sense to you. An example, a, a, a self-exploratory example, what I'm just talking about is so vital. So I just suggested, um, like here, problem three, let's skip here. I, I said for square matrices is a, let, let's do a, the problem, problem three I have in there. I said, look, let's create two matrices and see what they do, okay? So for instance, it, it says, and this is just, just a test, one of many, many test cases, but it, it's, a, it's like a simple test. Create a matrix, one, two, three, four. Now, you can create that with um, um, several automatic commands, but let's just get it typed in so we can get to it. If you wanna go to a new line, in your thing, you put a, a semicolon rather than parentheses. Also, you do not, if you just put a space in MATLAB, that'll assume it's a comma in there if you want to skip right the center of space. But let's see what that does. So, we, we and, and also, before we run, I like this clear the screen. I, I want to look at only what my new stuff is. There's up in editor, run. Let's run this. Uh, Oh, I gotta save it. All right. Save. Save as. Now, now let me let me show you something that might be you use what you should do, and I'm going to do, is I'm gonna make a subdirect. I have, I don't just have one directory ME2004. Of course I have that. But under it I have subdirectories on workshops, homeworks, course policy, those kinds of things. And I'm going to make a subdirectory called lectures. And this is what lecture, whatever this is for. And I'm going to save this under lecture four. Um, so that I have it documented. This is what we did. And then later, next time or next week or whatever, last, you know, professor, last Monday you did such and such. I can pop it back up. I can find it immediately because I'll find another date and I'll find exactly what we did. To make yourself, to save your work and save them in directories and subdirectories, I think is a lifetime skill, what I highly suggest you all do. It's hard for me to check that. I can't give you a test on that. I can't go personally into your computer and look, but I really suggest it. It's, it's like organizing your socks or something. You know, I would suggest that you, in your clothes, let's say your clothes, let's say there's just all big pile of clothes. You haven't organized them by shirts and pants and socks and you're late for class and you just rush and you grab some clothes and put them on and you end up with, you know, a white sock, a green sock, two shirts and no pants. You know, I mean, you say, I was rushed. I, you know, you come in, I was rushed. Why don't you have pants on? I was right. Well, you know, if things were organized in your drawers, you could more easily get dressed in a logical, logical fashion. So um, I can't go check your browser. Yes. Can you communicate from the sock drawer to the underwear drawer? Can I, can I do what can I? Can you communicate from both? Can I communicate from the sock drawer to the underwear drawer? Uh, yeah. Communicate. I don't know if I communicate, but you, you better believe I have a separate drawer for each of those. And I, I have so many white socks for things. I actually have so many socks. I got an actual drawer for white socks and one for, you know, non-white socks, you know, you know, uh, because I have so many socks. So that's, that's pretty neurotic, but. Um, I, I think there's some people that actually iron their underwear or something. You know, I don't, not that bad, but, uh, but anyway. Um, so anyway, we have to save this. So I'm not going to make a big deal every time by saving, but let's save as, and I, I'm going to form a directory here. Um, there's ME204, and I have the classes, and I have so much with this class. I'll have more subdirectories than you will but I'm gonna save it here and then I'm gonna form a, a thing. And I'm gonna save it as, what's, what's today's class? Uh, um, uh, four? One, two, three. No, but it's, uh, it's uh, let's call lecture, lecture four. So it's, it's, nice for, it's actually called lecture four in the, lecture four. Oh, 
okay, I'm gonna save this as lecture four, save. Because it's, it's, lecture three is called the workshop, you know, that's why I have it in, in, in the syllabus. Okay, so before the, now we can run the thing. Change folder, right. Okay, now we can run an experiment. And you can see it made this matrix that I wanted. Oh my goodness, we're almost out of time. So I need to complete this next time. Let's do a couple other little things here. Let's form the matrix B. Now, in, in, in the spirit of tools, there's something in MATLAB called the ones command. Let's run this one again. I'll run this one again. And ones, when you put something like this, it creates, it's just, this is not, not critical to MATLAB, but one of the useful things, because often you want to form a matrix of just, we'll say ones. Two means it's a two by two. Um, but we have a matrix of twos. So we'd probably put twos run. Doesn't recognize twos, it's not a, that's not a command. How do you think we could, could we use the, could we use the tool ones to make twos? How about two times the ones? There you go. So there's nothing, there's nothing. So it's not like the ones command is the most important thing in MATLAB by any stretch of the imagination. It's just one of many, many tools that I found useful, um, especially with matrices. It's got tons of little tools. Okay, that created those. We are, oh darn it, we are out of time here. Anyway, I'm going to save this one. I am going to pick up a Wednesday's class at this point. I want to discuss these matrices and the subtleties on matrices and multiplying them and the structure and a lot of things. So um, please save this and, and we will pick this up next time. Um, also, I don't know if everybody, we got to everybody, but uh, we can do log on 10 minutes early for um, uh, some more pets and, you know, pictures and whatever you got next time. Then we'll promptly start the lecture at 1010. Okay, we'll formally end right there. And uh, Mohammed, myself, Jason out there, we'll, we'll hang around here for anybody who wants to chat or talk or whatever you want to do. Okay, thank you all. Professor? Um, I have a question about the homework. There's, um, it says there's like a homework formatting guide and um, the plot guidelines. I couldn't find that in the on Canvas. Okay, wait, wait, what was that? Uh, a, a, a what guideline? Uh, the plot guidelines. Oh, where's my... Where's my Google? Let's the Google share. Okay, go back. All right, let's see. Assignments. And now, is this, this is the student view, right? Okay, good. Assignment one. Let's see what's under there. There's homework formatting, plot formatting, publishing. Um, here's the things. Also, from the home thing, from the home thing, we formed here's how to get on the uh, Thursday and Friday workshops. We have this right here. Um, which also, it just links to those things there. So this is, if you can't find them there, uh, many of these files have been they're They're in the, there might be in the files, but they're also linked say in this little table. I think this table is, is useful. Uh, so that it kind of keeps you a little summary of what we're doing now and what's due and things like that. But, there's a, it links to assignment one. It's another way to get there. But is your question about homework formatting or? Yeah, that, that's good. I found it. Yeah, about homework, homework formatting. And, uh, you know, I'm a visual learner. And when I see big, I, I get this stuff every morning about the, the virus and all this stuff. And so, I mean, I guess it looks like a lot to read, but it's a lot to read one time, you know, to start the semester. So, um, you know, sorry to overload you with things. I know there's a lot on your table already, but that, that at least it's documented there and documented in detail. Um, and that doesn't mean you're going to know where everything is, but, but do click around on the, uh, on the Canvas site to get very familiar with where things are and the structure of them. And, and many things are linked they're in the file, they're linked at least at least two spots, sometimes three places you can find them that makes sense. Um, the media gallery, for instance. Uh, 
people want to know that so far we've got two classes and, and two workshops. So well, one workshop presented twice. So there's four things there um, so far. And I will continue to post those. You can, you can get them, look at them like this or what you can a collapsed view there. If you want to, you don't have to look at the picture. You can just look at the more collapsed view of that. So uh, just everything to get familiar with. I, I guess I like that view the best. Um, that's my personal, I don't think you should be able to see that one, no, because of student view, um, et cetera. So here's back to the home page. Um, this is some information. Uh, the next thing, it just reminded me, I have not posted office hours. I would have been to do that. So uh, the next thing, next change to the, to the home page you're going to find is office hours. And I think it would make sense to put them right after our IDs here. So I think I'll put office hours right in this spot right here. This is this is something, you know, the, because of the three of us, we're all actively involved with this. You, you know, things I look on the website, sometimes things have changed. Some, you know, Jason or Mohammed put something like, uh, I guess Jason put this or did you put this, Mohammed? Jason. Put business card. And, uh, you know, just click on it. It's kind of a fun little thing. I guess we need to download into MATLAB. Something Jason programmed. Um, you know, it's good, probably not going to run because it says version four. Mm. Yeah, change folder. Yeah, it's, it says version four. I got to download as one. But anyway, it's just a fun little thing. You don't have to deal with that if you don't want to. Um, let me go back here. I'm not there, am I? Is that what you're looking at right now? Yeah, when you download several, when you download something and then the second time you download it, it puts a one and a two or three after or whatever. And then, then if it has the name with it, if MATLAB, if, if it has a name without a three and it has a three in there, you know, MATLAB doesn't recognize it. But um, you don't worry about this. It's a fun little thing, but I'll put the office hours. There's lots and lots of material here. Um, and then you've got what, four or five classes or six classes with all this you've got to get used to. I, I guess after a while, you, you Canvas looks more or less the same for all your professors. So it's not like each class brand new stuff. Nevertheless, what I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't envy your task. I think, I think it's very challenging. I think it's so much nicer and better to be personally with you guys in front of me and see your smiling faces, but that's okay. We're not gonna sit there and go, eh, you know, we'll do the best we can. Okay, how many chats did we get today? Almost, yeah, not, not much. Not much today, okay. Uh, not sure. So, 90, I said not much, looks like over 99 of them, but anyway, that's a lot. Yeah, so one of the concerns from the students also like about like the homework, are you going to go like to work like during this week for the exam? Or do you need mm -hmm. to get uh, more guidelines? No. Or the homework? Um, well, well, we can click on the homework here. Let's see. Um, screen share. So if, for example, you have like care fitting problems or... Oh, do we? Wait, today's homework? Yeah. Wait a minute, do we? Oh, better cover that then. Assignment one. Okay, here's assignment one. Let's open it up. Homework one. Okay, the standard probability, boom. The spring thing. You know, you did the spring kind of thing. You know. No, I actually need to change the screen. I thought it did. Hmm. Can you see all Oh. Let's see. Share screen. Wait, wait, wait. Share screen. Okay, this one, the hooky and spring, you kind of did that, you had that as an example. I didn't, anyway, that was, mm -hmm. but I, okay. the curve, well, which question, like this problem three? Yeah. Okay, evidently there's been some questions on problem three. 
so here's some data, F and velocity and, and um, drag force. Notice drag force goes up with velocity and the curve fit is this formula here, estimates the drag. So store the data in two vectors, create the curve fit as an anonymous function and then plot them, basically plot them both. Okay, so I, I didn't get to functions today, but next time I'll get, I'll, next time I plan the matrices thing, continue the matrices things, and I'll get right to functions and, and how to do that. The anonymous function, I'll have to discuss. And some of my exercises in there. M file exercise. M file exercise. There we go. Okay. Okay. So the answer about here, part B, an anonymous function. Please look it up, but I will make a point to discuss what an anonymous function is next time as I'm discussing how to make a function. So that's one of the topics we need to discuss next time is a function. Um, please, you can also get a head start on that or, or look it up, up yourself. I think there's something like an anonymous function. If, if you first look at it yourself and then listen to what I have to say, it'd probably be better. Uh, of course, you can listen to me first and then do your anonymous function, but um, in my in, in my little introduction to MATLAB, section 7.5, section 7.5, passing functions to functions is where I discuss the anonymous function. So you can look at 7.5 in my, my little intro and we will cover it next time and of course, uh, supplement with example. I think to just state a function in MATLAB is just not, not good enough. At least, at least try at least one simple test case on everything, if not an extensive, extensive bunch of testing. So, because you, know, you can always read, you know, the, the doc, but sometimes it's, it's can, you know, just don't catch on to what it's saying right there. So I guess it was probably about the anonymous function was the, the questions, right? And uh, and yeah, another guy asking like if you can go over like if plot the future or the plot command. Yeah, if you plot, yeah, you're asking you like you use this function, if you plot on uh, oh, a function plot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think problem three needs. We we're going to cover all these things. Need some help tomorrow. The f plot. Okay. Good. I hold on. F plot. Okay. Okay, good. I'm good. We'll make a note of the things that we need to discuss. Plus, in part of the workshop, you know, you guys are going to be logged on to the workshop help. And, you know, if there's no other questions about the workshop, we can also mm -hmm. try to try to help with the homework during those times. And what else in here? Uh, all right, there's five questions. Oh. Note the question came up last time and can I see this? Yes. In Friday's thing about should it be one file or not? Actually, it says in here, complete all problems in one capital, neatly organized script. So we'll do one script and therefore you'll have one um, PDF. Certainly you could, or you, certainly you could make five different scripts and five different PDFs, but with these little small problems like this, I think it's much easier for you guys to upload them 
as two files, a PDF and a, rather than 10 files. And it's certainly a lot easier for us to grade them than they have to click on all 10 of your files to, to click on too. So for you and us, in this case, a single, single script and a single PDF would be much easier. As said here with the, in capital one, we should put bold and red and flashing, you know. Uh, matter of fact, I might, I should in class next time, some people have logged off, a lot of people have logged off, I should make a point of that because then we're gonna get some people handing in 10 files. Four people left. Okay. All right, folks. Well, uh, ask you something. Well, this 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 notation here. People put that. Does that mean well, I agree or what is that? There's that must mean something. <laughs> Oh, the chat, the chat, I have no idea. <laughs> People do that a lot and it must have a meaning. It's like, it's like, does that look like a smile or? Yeah, like, uh, it must mean something. I had quite a few chats. I mean, there was, I don't know how many, but mine said more than 99. Okay. Glad they're asking these questions because we got to go. Okay, gang. Well, if if there's no more questions, only nine people left. If there's no more questions, I think I'll log off here. Speaker view. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. We'll see you all on Wednesday. I'm gonna quit this thing.